Even non-cat lovers will surely find this interesting, my cat Eglantine seemed to be saying. I remember the story I was told. A little boy's cat was hit by a car and killed. None of the kittens his parents gave him could replace his cat. The boy was desperate. A few years later, this little Texan boy became a successful businessman, rich enough to finance a cloning research center. He started the Genetic Savings and Clone Company to clone the aging or even deceased pets of very wealthy clients. Genes from a cell of their beloved animal were to be placed in the nucleus of an embryonic cell, then implanted in the uterus of a surrogate mother. The first cloned cat, named Carbon Copy, was proudly presented to the press in February 2002. Alas, it turned out to be a grey and white tabby that looked nothing like the gene donor, an orange and black spotted female named Rainbow. Though the DNA mother and the cloned cat had the exact same genes, it doesn't seem that was enough to make them identical. I began to see Eglantine, my trickle or tabby, through different eyes. I now realized that genetics alone could not explain all of heredity. But what had those cat cloning geneticists missed? Out of curiosity, I visited several European scientists in search of an answer. And that's how I discovered a whole hidden life of our genes. Is it that a genetically identical clone of a cat could end up with different colors? Geneticist Philip Avner, head of research at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, began to clue me in. These are cats that were cloned and uh, once, before one did the experiment, people would have said, well, these, we're going to clone a cat or we're going to clone an animal. That means the genetic content should be absolutely identical. And are they identical? Well, the answer is no, because the genetics is identical, but the epigenetics is different. The genetics is identical, but the epigenetics is different. That's right, Eglantine. Epigenetics. A word that opened my eyes to the major transformation taking place in biology. And the prospects of this transformation for our health, the treatment of diseases such as cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes and obesity are immense. It was over the course of my visits to some of Europe's leading epigenetic researchers that I began to understand how the way in which an organism utilizes its genes can be as important as the genes themselves. I can still hear them. I think we share 90% of our genes with a banana and um, something like 95, 97% of, of our genes with a mouse and an even higher number with, with chimpanzees. Yes, we're more than the sum of our genes. We're all born with genes. We receive more of them from our mothers than from our fathers, but that's just the beginning saying it's your grandchildren that may inherit um, the consequence of your lifestyle. 
Geneviève Almousny at the Curie Institute in Paris studies the phenomena responsible for varying expression of genes. Genetic information is contained in the genome that we know. But then we have to understand how this information will be expressed and through what parameters its expression can be adjusted. She pointed out a wonderful example of epigenetics evolving the caterpillar and the butterfly. Though they have the same DNA, thus the same genes, those genes are expressed differently. I remember that we, like plants and other animals, are made up of billions of cells, each with a nucleus that contains our DNA. Our genes are portions of that long DNA chain, which in each person is unique. And each of our cells contains the same DNA. And yet each cell family is different. I learned from Amanda Fisher in London that this difference is due to the epigenetic control of genes. I guess the intrigue, if you like, is really that all the cells in, in a person's body contains exactly the same DNA, and yet how that DNA is used um, is clearly different. So uh, a cell in your big toe is clearly different from a, uh, a cell in your eye, for example. And so really um, it's kind of understanding how this... Uh, uh, identical DNA copy can translate in, to all these different functions. You know, the problem is how do you use that single um, piece of information, that DNA, to, to generate all the diversity of functions in the body? Um, that's the conundrum. In London, Richard Festenstein explained to me that in fact each type of cell expresses only a part of the body's DNA. For example, in a red blood cell, what do you need to do? Well, you need to carry oxygen around the blood, so you have hemoglobin. So you have globin genes, which make the components of hemoglobin, uh, and these need to be expressed at very high levels. There are various other proteins that have to be expressed in red cells to maintain the structure of the cell, um, various buffering capacities of the cell, but they are a very limited number of genes which give that cell its identity. A large number of the genes strung out along the DNA chain are inactive in each type of cell of our body, while others are active and thus can be expressed by the cell. When a gene is active, the code from that part of the DNA containing the gene is read by a protein. Then encoded by a messenger RNA and carried out of the cell's nucleus for the synthesis of the proteins needed to function. So, you see, Eglantin, the cells in our bodies, all of which contain the same DNA, can perform different functions. In plants and animals alike, the origin of all life begins with a single cell. Through successive divisions, that cell becomes an embryo. But how are the 200 types of cells that make up the human organism created from an identical genome? It was Azim Surani, a leading stem cell researcher at Cambridge who explained embryonic stem cells to me. These are cells from very early embryos which also have the capacity to become almost any other cell type. In the stem cell all the genes are potentially active so they have they retain the potential to activate any gene so they have a great degree of plasticity. As development progresses, cells start to become more and more specialized in response to who their neighbors are, what signals they get, and they start to differentiate. But they have to do it in a coordinated manner. They have to take account of you know who their neighbors are because to make the whole organism, it has to happen in a controlled way. Each time cells start to make decisions and go towards a particular fate, there is a selection of genes that are 
upregulate and some are switched off. Once the decision is made and the final cell fate has been decided, then that decision is remembered and propagated. It would make a mess if, for example, the liver cells turned into neurons and neurons turned into liver. So this locking in of the memory is an epigenetic process. I mean, cell, cell division is very well um, choreographed and coordinated. And it has to be uh, very well um, set up because um, you have to copy not only all of the, the genetic code, but also the, the imprints, whether that gene is expressed or not expressed, into daughter cells. The ability to reproduce is the main criterion for all life. And to reproduce, cells must divide. Our existence is dependent on billions of cells in our bodies constantly dividing and dying. Even the cells in our bones are constantly being renewed in this way. Epigenetic cell memory retains the way in which genes are expressed and passes that memory on to daughter cells. The memory of cell adaptation to the environment can also be passed on. I learned from Uli Grossniklaus in Zurich that this was first discovered in plants and that it's something all gardeners know. Plants are, are true masters in epigenetic control because of their sessile lifestyle they, they cannot move they, where they germinate that's where they will stay all their life which can be hundreds of years even thousands of years they really have to integrate environmental signals it's snowing yes if the snow stays then many plants will get the prolonged exposure to cold they will get vernalized and they will remember that they had the cold. They really need a long period of cold that leads to epigenetic silencing of a key floral gene, which is called FLC, and that is then kept down. And together with other influences, both from within the plant and from outside, mostly the day length and temperature, then a decision is made now the plant can flower and that will only happen in spring usually this memory of winter known as vernalization is necessary in order for certain plants to flower each year if you vernalize a plant and then bring it back to the normal temperature this plant will remember for many many cell divisions that long ago it experienced cold and it can even remember that if you take individual cells, put them in tissue culture, years after the cold treatment happens. So this is very typically epigenetic. But if you then go through the seed, the plant produces a seed, that memory is erased. Because the new seed, of course, the new plant coming from a seed, then has to go through a new cold period before it can flower. Plants have no nervous system but I learned that they do record a memory of winter. Even my cat, Eglantine, seemed curious to know how a cell's memory could inscribe itself in a gene. It was Thomas Yenuvine in Vienna who showed me how DNA is organized in the nucleus. The DNA molecule would be two meters long, but it has to fit into a very small cell. So it has to be compacted, it has to be packaged and more than 10,000 fold. And this packaging is done by the organization of the DNA around these spheres. And they are made up of proteins and the proteins are called histones. And uh, the combination of this cylinder, this protein cylinder, with the DNA double helix. This is what's called chromatin. Additional layers of compaction have to occur. And this will be done by additional superhelical organization of the nucleosomes. And even more, until it can fit 
into the nucleus that is most compact when cells would divide. He explained that compacted bundles of DNA, called chromosomes, form when a cell divides. Each chromosome contains a thousand or so genes, and the 23 pairs of chromosomes in our bodies contain our 25,000 genes. It's an extremely sophisticated, finely worked organization, like haute couture, and we'll be able to intervene precisely in this intricate way the DNA winds around the material in order to render it accessible or inaccessible. By intervening in the wrapping and unwrapping action of DNA around these tiny histone spools, new treatments for diseases linked to the defective expression of genes become possible. Using a model, Thomas Yenuvain demonstrated how different enzymes can activate or deactivate a gene, thus making it accessible or not. With the white histones and blue DNA of his model, I began to see more clearly. So there are enzymes uh, that can place a chemical modification on the chromatin template and then make chromatin active. And one of these modifications is called histone acetylation, exemplified by this blue flag. So the enzyme would become activated in the cell and uh, upon this modification, this would be the signal for these protein spheres to extend and open up chromatin. And now genes can become activated. It was here in Thomas Yenuvine's laboratory that an inverse system which silences genes was discovered. Now there is another modification, it's a stop signal. That's why it's indicated by this red hexagon. It's called methylation. But it's histone methylation. So it will again be placed onto the nucleosome, not on the DNA, and this would now have the opposite effect. If chromatin is methylated, then it will become condensed and thereby inactivate genes. Many methyl marks can be placed on chromatin, and then this is a configuration where genes cannot become activated. Acetylation, methylation are only two examples. We know about at least 30 different modifications that can impinge uh, on the chromatin substrate. Histone methylation, which renders a gene inactive, is transmitted from mother cells to daughter cells. Thomas Yenuvine added that this epigenetic heritage is reversible, whereas genetic heritage is not. Under a fluorescent microscope, one can see methylated genes tightly wrapped around histones and grouped into separate zones. These zones intrigued Amanda Fisher because they demonstrate that within a cell's nucleus, there is a kind of ecosystem which influences gene activity. Where genes lie within the sort of structure of chromosomes is critically important. So there are areas of chromosomes that are um, sort of repressive they, uh, they like to silence genes. So if you normally, if you're a gene and you normally live near that environment, you have to develop mechanisms to cope with that. Giacomo Cavelli, involved in Drosophila research in Montpellier, showed me an example. The nucleus of the cell is very organized. It's not just a bag containing a jumble of DNA. This organization carries important information. This is an epigenetic phenomenon that we're studying in the lab, which is subject to the position of the gene inside the nucleus of the cell. This is a normal drosophila, seen through an electronic microscope. Here we can see the eye, and this structure here is the antenna. 
Certain genes must be repressed for the antennas to form. Now, there's a specific gene that, if expressed, would cause legs to form in their place. Up here, we can see a drosophila with that transformation. Where the antennas would normally exist, we find structures that are, in fact, legs. It's a partial transformation of the antenna into a leg. It's the same DNA sequence, except that here the gene changed position in the nucleus, and that loss of organization causes the gene to express itself when it should be repressed. We have a lot in common with fruit flies because we share most of our genes with them. And basic genetic mechanisms can easily be transposed to superior organisms. The chemical and physical properties of our DNA can be modified by the environment and by our life experience. This is built in us. Components in our organism receive signals of a changing environment, like the variation in richness or abundance of food, and that information is transmitted in the nucleus and modifies it. Our DNA is equipped with such a mechanism. Yes, it's truly amazing. It's the exact thing that keeps us alive on the planet. The body relies on this capacity to adapt to the environment. The stability of the organism is endlessly compromised, but that is how we gain the capacity to adapt to a changing environment. So you see, Eglantine, our genes act as a source which can then be interpreted by the body in function with the way we live. Lifestyle and diet can have a great influence on them. Clearly, you know, diet can influence uh, predisposition to a number of different conditions. And perhaps epigenetics is providing an explanation of that at the moment. And if one understood it rather better, then um, perhaps one could, uh, could have, if you like, personalised medicine, where depending on your uh, genetic constitution and your epigenetic profile, one could um, advise people of the benefits of certain things and, and what, to, what to avoid, too. Yeah, the question is... Uh the question is, can the epigenetic marks linked to changes in chromatin structures be influenced by the food we eat? The answer is yes, up to a point, for not everything we eat immediately gets converted. But since enzymes such as methyltransferase and histone acetyltransferase require cofactors like methyl donor folate, which are found in food, it's important to know which foods contain these cofactors. Avocados are very rich in folate, meaning they are a foodstuff which activates methyltransferase. So you could tag them as containing methyl. And avocados are very good for you. And so is broccoli, which is also rich in methyl donor folate and S. adenosyl methylthionine. However, just like everything in life, it all depends on the right dose. If it's not too large or too small, it will stimulate enzyme activity in the cell. That's it. Right dose, good taste. And a well-balanced diet stimulates enzyme activity.
Other examples are ultraviolet radiation, stress, what matters is diet, lifestyle, exercise, as well as the risks we expose ourselves to. So here we clearly see the impact of the environment. We are more than the sum of our genes, and the environment can affect the structure of chromatin and the genes, and that's a very important aspect of epigenetic research. So you see, Eglantine, the expression of genes corresponds to variations in the environment. One of the mechanisms responsible for this adaptability was unexpectedly discovered in the 90s in a greenhouse in Holland. While attempting to enhance the color of a petunia flower, researchers stumbled upon an astonishing fact. The faithful RNA messengers responsible for color got mixed up. It was Jan Kutter who explained this to me in Amsterdam. It all took place in this greenhouse. The first experiment was done here, and as the plants grew, we discovered a strange phenomenon. We took petunias and inserted extra color genes into them. For example, this color. But some of the petunias ended up with white flowers. And that was the first sign of a process we now call RNA interference, which can eventually induce epigenetic changes. RNA interference involves double-stranded RNA, which are cut into short pieces that subsequently trigger changes in a messenger RNA. Some of these micro-RNA leave the cell's nucleus and neutralize the RNA messengers of the color gene already present. Others directly block the fabrication of RNA messengers. So you obtain flowers that are completely white, as here. Or partially white, which indicates gene inactivation due to an epigenetic change. This area here is not completely inactivated. And this is typical of epigenetics, where you can have a gradation from 100% active to 100% inactive. The discovery of RNA interference in plants was responsible for the important progress that has been made in human and animal research. Thanks to this type of RNA, it's now possible to intervene in the expression of a given gene opening up the way to new treatments and new research. What it tells us is that there's yet another layer of control. The new concept of, that is also emerging now is that these microRNAs are also designed to control the amount of protein that is, that is made. We're beginning to understand how these microRNA function. Some deal with structuring, some regulate gene expression, others have functions we have yet to discover. I now understood that gene activity in a cell is controlled by the structure of the cell's nucleus, the way the DNA winds round the histones, as well as the RNAs that circulate within the cell, which scientists call the epigenetic profile. But what happens in cloned cats? Eglantine was impatient to find out. A cat's color depends on the genes located in the X chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes in each of their cells, one inherited from their father and one from their mother. 
but only one X chromosome is needed, and so only one of them is randomly inactivated. So part of a cat's color can be received from the father's X chromosome and part from the mother's. It was Philip Avner, specialist of X chromosome research, who explained to me how the thousands of genes they contain can be silenced. It all happens during early embryogenesis. So this is in the early part where the, the embryo is developing from a fertilized egg. And it's gonna, you're gonna start off with one cell, then we're gonna have two cells, four cells, eight cells, etc. And at a stage which we call the blastocyst, which is a, an early stage, the cells are gonna receive a signal which tells them that they're at a particular stage of differentiation. So it's gonna tell them now is the moment of, that you should start inactivating. And this signal is seen by a master switch region, which is on the X chromosome. In the mouse, it's in the middle of the X chromosome. And this master signal region is going to see the signal signal that comes in and its immediate reaction is going to be to increase the amount of a, a novel RNA. But this particular RNA never makes a protein. Its only function is to tell the chromosome that it's going to inactivate. That's why my cat Eglantine will always be unique. Even if she were cloned, her beautiful coat would still be missing. But natural clones do exist in nature. Identical twins are a perfect example. Me llamo Noemi. I'm Noemi. Yo Cristina. I'm Cristina. Tengo 18. I'm 18. Me too. <laughs> they share the same DNA sequence, but do they share the same epigenetics? Manel Estela gave me the answer at his laboratory in Barcelona. Studying monozygotic twins is quite interesting because they're human clones, created from the same cell, with the same DNA, and thus the same genome. For example, one can be ACGT and the other ACGT as well. They're copies of each other from a genetic viewpoint. But monozygotic twins are not truly identical. As they grow older, differences can appear. Twins who have lived together and been exposed to the same environment and toxins will be more alike. But if, say, one has lived in the city and the other in the country, they will be less alike, because their epigenetics might have changed, as well as their appearance and their resistance to disease. In the lab, we can study the epigenetic changes of both twins and clearly see the differences. Here we can see how the chromosome methylation contributes to epigenetics. These are the chromosomes of twins genetically and epigenetically similar. They're young and have similar lifestyles. These here are from older twins with different diseases, which is why their chromosomes are different. Some being red, others green, with hypermethylated zones and hypomethylated zones. I think it's really important to understand that our actions can impact on our cells. Every action, good or bad, has an effect. The theory says it is possible that epigenetic changes can be transmitted to our children. That might be worth investigating. Certainly the human animal has, has a lot of options uh, and because you know, we can use our intelligence to move away from toxic environments or to avoid damaging our cells. Um, the cells can, to some extent, respond to, to these kinds of uh, abuses um, and will try and cope with it. Um, 
but obviously there are limits and if the system is abused too much then the end point is is disease diseases related to bad diets such as obesity or tobacco and alcohol use even toxic exposures could benefit from epigenetic treatments doctors are realizing that in cancer it's the whole ecology of the cell that comes into play and not just that of altering certain genes un punto de giro de inflexión Epigenetic research took a great leap forward when it was discovered that genes that could suppress tumors could be epigenetically inactivated, such as the P16 melanoma gene or the BRCA1 breast cancer gene. Consequently, epigenetics is now taught to medical as well as biology students and is taken seriously by biomedical science. I don't know of any 100% genetic or epigenetic disease. Each is a combination of genetic and epigenetic changes. Some cancers will be caused by what we call mutation, so this is change in the genetic information itself, and some will be caused because the information is being badly used, but the information is remaining the same. Si on considère que l'épigénétique c'est Epigenetics can be described as the way a cell retains its identity. A tumor cell is a cell that has lost its identity. Research into how cells retain that information could lead us to understand how they lose it. So what happens in cancers is that sometimes in cancers we have switched off some of the genes that should really be on in the on state particularly these genes which we call tumor suppressor genes that, that have been switched off. And so there are clinical trials in place to see if these tumor suppressor genes which are in the off state can be switched on. Understanding of the epigenetic mechanisms may allow us to design new compounds and new drugs that can be used and, and with these drugs we can maybe try and see if we can, can get rid of these epimutations. It is uh, an easier proposition to some extent than trying to deal with a DNA mutation, which is very difficult. Take hyperproliferation of cancer cells. If we can target an aspect of that hyperproliferation with a therapeutic agent, only the cancer cells will be affected. There are now four epigenetic cancer treatments and some 50 clinical trials underway for new treatments. With the discovery of new proteins which regulate epigenetic phenomena almost every day, new medical treatments are on the horizon. There are probably other diseases where genes for, uh, are not expressed because of regulation, because of something that's gone wrong in, in programming them. And in those cases also, we can imagine that an epigenetic approach will, be, will produce interesting results. Epigenetic treatments already exist for leukemia and diabetes, in which the expression of certain genes which have become inactive and are linked to the disease is re-established through histone acetylation. André Fischer in Göttingen came up with the idea of studying the effects of certain medication on nerve cell renewal. He's trying to rebuild the spatial memory and sense of orientation in mice who have lost these capacities such as happens in Alzheimer's disease. This is a swimming test. The mouse should be able to find the hidden platform in the basin. This mouse was trained to find the platform, but we then induced neuronal degeneration in which nerve cells have died off. And you can see that this animal can no longer remember where the platform is. It's swimming around the basin and is completely lost. Its spatial memory is impaired, as one would expect from degenerated brain tissue. This mouse also suffers from neurodegeneration, but it received an epigenetic treatment of HDAC inhibitors, so it should be able to learn again.
We've discovered that if we take an animal suffering from Alzheimer's disease and inject it with a histone deacetylase inhibitor over a period of four weeks, the effect will be the same as if it had been placed in a stimulating environment. The animal can learn again. Its brain tissue begins to regenerate. New nerve cells are produced, which again connect with each other. Our hope is to establish which molecules are most crucial to this process so that we can design efficient therapies. Unfortunately, I don't think this approach will ultimately enable us to heal all possible diseases. Because we know that environmental factors can produce very different effects on different people. But I think that through our present research, which we hope will be useful in clinical trials, we can contribute to the discovery of new therapies for neurological diseases. Andre Fischer's research may lead to new and greater prospects. Does the uniqueness of each life experience inscribe itself in the epigenetic profile of our neurons? We hope to match brain processes, phenomena such as emotion, fear, learning, with molecular changes in DNA that ultimately lead to gene expression. In other words, we believe that changes in chromatin can be reciprocally related to the stimuli we are subjected to daily. We know from experiments with mice that new neurons can be formed in certain brain regions, as would seem to be the case in humans. There is a small area in the hippocampus called gyros dentatus, which produces up to 6,000 new neurons a day. Here on the left is the brain of a patient suffering from Alzheimer's. When one reaches the point of noticeably decreased mental ability, it is usually too late. In this region of the brain, the hippocampus, which is particularly vital for cognitive function, there is often already 50% degeneration. That means that we need neuroprotectives as well as regenerative strategies in order to effectively treat this disease. To find out, Andre Fischer is comparing the results from his animal research with the clinical results of psychiatrist Thomas Wobrock. You're doing quite well after six weeks, aren't you? After your exercises, we'll do another brain scan to see if the hippocampus, the region responsible for cognitive function, shows any improvement. And that would be great. We had patients exercise for three months and we did before and after MRI scans. We examined the whole hippocampus, the back as well as the lateral regions, looking for modifications and we discovered obvious differences in volume. We now have evidence that demonstrates the merits of neuroprotection as opposed to the mere treatment of symptoms. We must discover how to regulate the brain to regenerate and protect itself against further stress. This association of Andre Fischer's animal experiments and Thomas Wobrock's clinical tests offers the hope of finding new treatments to restore certain cognitive functions. The plasticity of stem cells provides even greater possibility for new therapies and scientists are searching for that same plasticity in other cells. This is such an exciting thing to think that you can take a cell all the way back where it started and ask it to retrace all the steps back to, to the end point. If we can understand the mechanism of erasure, then we can maybe take these cells right back to their embryonic state and really get them to behave like embryonic stem cells. I guess, you know, potentially it has a huge number of applications. So, um, 
uh, you know, for trauma, if, if, a, if you were involved in a car accident and, and perhaps needed uh, various tissues repaired, uh, including neural tissue or uh, skin tissue, then if you were able to take um, a source of cells from the individual and be able to reprogram them to do these specialized functions, then you could repair uh, the damaged tissue and there would be no problems of immune rejection. Back in Amanda Fisher's laboratory in London, I saw amazing images of cell reprogramming. We're taking um, a specialized cell type, a lymphocyte from the blood, and we're a human lymphocyte, and we're fusing that with an embryonic stem cell from mouse. And in this situation, the mouse embryonic stem cell reprograms the human lymphocyte to express the genes of a human ES cell. I don't think anybody understands the rules that govern it. They just know that that's the outcome. And so what we're trying to do then is to find out what do you need to convert a human lymphocyte into a human ES cell. Researchers are beginning to understand how the reactivation of only four key genes can give other cells the same pluripotency of stem cells. Once we understand the molecular detail of how this regenerative process is taking place, we can then apply this knowledge to deal with uh, problems of aging or disease tissues, either through cell replacement, um, making new cells and replacing the old ones with these in vitro uh, cells made in a dish, or we can get an understanding of how the rejuvenation process itself works so that it may become possible to design chemicals, compounds, drugs that can do this job um, and try and maybe induce stem cells that are in the body to, to replenish some of the diseased tissues or aging tissues. The use of stem cells to repair our bodies is now on the horizon. And Azim Sarani believes that epigenetic reprogramming will offer even more startling possibilities. The idea that you can take cells from two adult individuals, the skin cells, and make gametes, uh, sperm and eggs, to give rise to a whole new organism is uh, quite an amazing prospect. There are obviously many problems that need to be overcome, but you know, once you start to see glimpses of possibilities, then I think, I think that the road is open then, and it will happen. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. The reversibility of epigenetic states is a secret hidden deep in our genes. International networks of scientists studying epigenetics anticipate a whole new class of therapeutics. The possibility of establishing personal epigenetic profiles opens the way to personalized medicine and treatment. We will find new keys to unlock the destiny of ourselves. But, as Thomas Yenivine asks, with whom should this knowledge be shared? I know that I'm genetically predisposed to live to be a certain age, as well as to suffer from some diseases. Certain environmental influences might affect me and significantly alter my lifestyle, environment and social behavior. We must discuss these issues publicly, as they concern not only scientists, but politicians, ethicists and the whole of society as well. We must not stop these developments based on knowledge obtained from prior discoveries which have changed our understanding of life and our behavior towards one another in a modern society.
If you talk to non-scientists a little bit about epigenetics, they very much like the idea that um, that while your genes may be, if you like, the, um, the hand of cards that you're dealt from your parents, epigenetics provides a way where you can modify that hand or play it in a different way that might give you a different outcome. And I, I think that's a kind of very hopeful um, idea. So, Eglantine, you see, we're not strictly defined by our genes. Our environment can also have a profound effect upon us, both positively and negatively. And we too are partly responsible for the constant rebuilding of the cells in our bodies. Epigenetics provides us with a new approach to the relationship between our bodies and the world around us.